how you measure experiences. And if you look at starting that vision in 2006, I remember calling a prominent airline and saying, hey, we want to power all your feedback. And they're like, if our customers are pissed off, they'll just call us. And I'm like, well, that's not going to scale very well. And now we have, you know, almost every airline is powering the feedback on Wall Street. And so if you look at that, in all of the learning that has had to happen, um, even up to going public. I mean, my big goal for 2018 was we were going to go public, and we had been preparing, we had stayed cash flow positive. We wanted to tell the perfect story. I knew the story I wanted to be telling out on the road show. I knew it a year and a half ago. And when we went out there, it was exactly what we wanted to tell. And we got the exact response that we wanted to have. You know? And... <coughs> Then something that we didn't plan happened. We wanted to take this vision of XM to the whole world. And we'd always kind of had strategic interests along the way. We were kind of the runaway bride where we would never close the deal. And you know, if you you know, a lot of people don't know SAP or I mean I would say the competition's done a pretty good job in the US of painting them as a big slow moving German company. But when I met Bill McDermott, it was like the exact opposite. I was like, I don't know you, and I know everyone else, so like, let's walk through this. And for them to be able to line up in one week $8 billion cash and be able to do a deal and to be able to say that XM and what we're working on is going to be the future in the cloud, and then hearing the story of how they've gone from $11 million in cloud business in 2011 to $5 billion today, just in the cloud between Concur and Rebo success factors and some of those products. It's pretty inspiring. And I'm like, hey, let's go. And then I stood up, you know, a month ago and their sales kickoff with 8,500 enterprise sales reps ready to go take Qualtrics to the world. That's pretty cool, right? And that was just the US. And so, when, when we have that type of vision, yeah, it's probably not what I grew up originally, but I think these are the bet the business type decisions that you've got to have as a CEO and entrepreneur. I wonder if you could just talk about, okay, so you have this vision for, this is how I want to be at the end, this is how I want to go out, that makes sense. Like, how, how far in advance do you feel like you need to see in order to stay on the right path? Like, in, 2005, could you see through the next 18 months or two years? Could you see five years? Because a lot of times it's founders like, well, hey, like, where, like, where is this going to be? How big is this going to be? Yeah. And it's like, how, how can I really know where this is going to be in 15 years? Yeah, everyone underestimated how big Qualtrics could be. Like, even our VCs, I mean, I remember 2012, bless their hearts, they thought that it was the most they could get to it was like a $300 million valuation because of the limited market cap. And no one would have thought that we would have started in the academic market gone from academic to corporate, selling small deals of like five to 15, 30 grand, then go from 60 grand up to selling, you know, $20 million deals last quarter, that evolution. And then going from surveys to feedback and experience and going from just research to customer, employee, and putting it all, no one would have been able to do that. But what you do is, you sit here, I mean, my strategy, and it works different, some people are able to go longer. I look at, obviously I look at product vision more than one year, because it takes a lot of time to develop products. But when I look at, um, I, I always look at our, our big bets. We have something called big bets in Qualtrics, where I just took the whole company through this. I actually introduced these to SAP because I said, hey, you know, being a startup and a founder, the world's noisy. You get pulled in a million different directions, especially if you have a really good platform that people want to use. It's really hard to stay focused. And if we can say, come hell or high water, what are the five things that we're going to accomplish this year no matter what? So no matter what, we have to do that. So I'll give you a great example. At Qualtrics, we had one that said, hey, we're going to hit 100% of our hiring plan. And we had... We had to hire 960 people on top of a base of 1,300 with probably 50% of them in Provo, Utah. Right, that's hard. Plus a diverse group of people, and if you've been to Utah, it's not that diverse. 
And so we're looking at it going, okay, how do we do this? Oh, by the way, surprise acquisition in Q3, right? But we hit our plan at 970. We, we beat it, you know, 100 and something percent of our plan. And you go back and like, why did that happen? It's because we focused all year long that these were the five bets that we were going to hit that year. We only had five. All the other noise happened, but we could always bring the company back to those five initiatives. And not only that, we had every single employee lining up their personal goals to those five initiatives. And one of those was revenue, and you've seen OKR. One of them was revenue. Nothing was better than having 400 engineers have a revenue target and what they're going to do to increase that, right? I mean, they come up with stuff that salespeople have never come up with. And then we look at it on a quarterly basis. So with hiring, if we're going to hire 960 people, I'm thinking a year out, I get to Q1 and we've only hired 70, what happens? Something has to change. We got to Q3 on hiring and we weren't there. It looked like we were going to miss. And then that's where you get scrappy and you get everyone involved and you start rallying and you do unnatural things. And I think if you look at Qualtrics, it's a series of 17 years of people doing unnatural things. And I think that's where the breakthroughs happen and that's where the magic happens. And so I think if you can structure and pull a big group of people around to target something that everyone's passionate about and do it in a way, you will do things that you never anticipated you'd be able to do. I know you did all of the early deals at Qualtrics for a very long time. You both were sales and then you ran sales. Um, you know, you talk about in the early days doing five, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar deal, and then now somebody did a twenty million dollar deal, which that's pretty incredible. Um, and and I think <coughs> I, I did a million dollar deal too. You you personally? Yeah, I'm still selling it. Do you get commission? Or? <laughs> that's a commission. I can pick up the couches. <laughs> uh, um, so. I mean, again, when you're selling five, two thousand dollar deal, five thousand or ten thousand dollar deal, could you even imagine selling the product for twenty-five million, a quarter million dollars, or half a million dollars? It's or? the same motion, but I mean, I think there's this element that, like in the in the old world, you could have you could have a bad product and a good sales team, and it worked, or you could have um, a good product and a bad sales team, and it worked. In today's world. You have to be good at both. And there's not one company that's come out. It's just a matter of when you're gonna to have to develop that muscle. And so I see a lot of founders are like, hey, we got everything going, the product's ready, I just gotta look for someone to go take it to market. And it's like, no one's gonna take it, someone's not gonna come in on a white horse, you load the product, and all of a sudden it's gonna take off. Like, that's not gonna happen. And so, you've got to be able to develop in the DNA like, my whole executive team, I want them out selling. I don't, I don't care what your background is. I don't care who you are. Everyone is selling. And if you can't sell, how do you expect other people to be able to sell? We, we're all salespeople. We're all trying to get or impart something from someone else at some point. Right? Dan Pink wrote this book. It's like, to sell is being human. And... We did a big Qualtrics study to start it off, but it's true. It's like, it doesn't mean we need to be greasy salespeople with our frequent flyer stuff. I think that's, that's not what we're doing. Like, we need to be, we need to be thoughtful that you have to be able to communicate your value and your story and not build something that you expect someone else to do with. And so, um, I, think, I think this is where luck comes in as well, is because you can't fake multi, multi-million dollar deals. You have to have value for the customer. I think a lot of startups come out and they're like, okay, we've got this great product and I'm gonna go sell it. And my first question is, where's the budget coming from? Well, I never thought about that. Well, why? It should be the first thing you're thinking about. Well, it's just a good product, so someone should buy it. Well, I'm your buyer. I run Qualtrics. I have my budget. Who's paying for this? 
It's not all just discretionary money tree that I can go grab and give it to people. Like, what are you replacing? What's the old way of doing it? Everything can't be net new. Oh, you didn't know you had this problem, but here it is. Like, you've got to replace the old if you're going to scout. You've got to be able to say, hey, look, you're using these 13 things and you're outsourcing this, and this is what it's costing you. Here's the new. And this is why you should buy it. And here's how you're going to get a return. And they'll be like, yeah, five, $5 million sounds like a great deal if that's what we're going to save. And better, you've got to be able to prove it to them and then scale. Because what you want is your customers to keep building and keep buying more. So that's that helps with how you develop product and then how you go to market. Well, and in the early days, right, so, it's so who doesn't love building a product like and being creative and coming up with new ideas, right? But, you know, we've got... And we've got all these investors, and, and you, you know, they're here on our stages talking about, hey, this is what I look for, and this, and this, and this. The reality is, you didn't take investment for over ten years, and you built a fifty million dollar revenue business before you even did that. Yeah, that, that's and, not. They look for cash. But so that's what I'm saying is like they're saying, hey, I want a person that does this, this. But the reality is, if you just sell, if you just do what you just told everyone to do, the other stuff will figure itself out. Right? Every single one of these investors, and these are all my buddies, are looking at the marijuana startups going, oh, I really want to go into this, but I can't. Why? Because I make so much money. <laughs> but my LPs are like children's hospitals. This doesn't work. <laughs> right? <laughs> investors care about cash. Like, if you make cash, you will always have a seat at the table. So let's just demystify everything that's out there. Show it to an investor. Show them you're making twenty million dollars cash. You will have a problem getting meetings. You will have a problem. You'll be, you'll be like, okay, come over to my place, and this is how we're going to do this. So whatever product you have, anytime you walk in where you're making money, um, you'll ne you'll never want. When it comes to to bootstrapping, I think that the couple of things is we were fifty million dollar run rate business, and we hadn't done one marketing one marketing meeting. So I had I had done one press release. I didn't know but, but you had the perfect name, the company Qualtrics. I mean, oh yeah, everyone knows what that means, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we had it out there, but we, we had cash. Like we, we were kicking off. I mean, in, in Q4 2011, we had nine million dollars in sales, kicking off five million dollars in cash. And we rolled into Silicon Valley, and they're like, "Hey, I'm taking you to Sand Hill Road." I was like, oh, where, "What's that? What's going on there? What do they do? Are they going to make me operate out here?" And I was like, "I literally woke up in the Rosewood Hotel in my cold sweats because I thought that I was going to have to move my whole family out here, which I love." But I was like, "No, I'm going to operate in Utah, um, which I love more." And <laughs> but. But the thing was is, and then we took, we raised the largest Series A since 2008. So picture this, largest Series A around $70 million in 2012 since 2008. GitHub came out, a month later raised it $100 million, and then all hell went loose, right? After that, the first article was written about us with a four-page article in Forbes. I think I was on CNBC 13 times. Like, I, I think if I look at the last six years, when we IPO'd, there were 300 media articles written about us. And it, they were all good. We didn't have one bad article. It was all like, wow, this is what we've been waiting for. It, it's, it's, everything's out there. We do a deal with SAP. The deal closes on Sunday. It all goes to the wire in Germany. The first thing we do is get out and meet with investors on a phone call that night. So Bill and I are up at Sundance in Utah. We've got a polycom in a cabin. And we're on the phone with all of these investors. And the first call, there's a group of investors. All right. All the SAP's public investors. Just everyone. Yeah. The whole investment community on a Sunday night. And we're like, hey, we'll take questions now. First question. Hey, Bill, you said you weren't going to buy anyone. Not only did you buy some, you spent $8 billion on a company we've never heard of. I'm like, what the heck? Like, I can't do more to get my name out there. And then second question, yeah, we've never heard of Qualtrics. 
And so I just got to the point where I'm like, all of these startups are trying to raise rounds so people hear about them. And, you know, we were it's on the every way to get press. Yeah, to the way to get press. And I'm like, it doesn't do anything for you. Because you get to the point where you have 300 articles, you're going public, you sell, and the first thing you get is, I've never heard of you anyways. <laughs> so just focus on creating a good business and just don't worry about it. Someone's going to read the press anyways. <laughs> Here, if you use Qualtrics, raise your hand or no, or are a user or not. So I see about see, you never heard of this. What percentage of people in the room do you think had actually used Qualtrics and just didn't know? I think we probably touched every single person in the room at some point where they've either given feedback or done something that's coming to their inbox or on our website and they're filling out a form and they don't realize it's us or a product. I mean, power 10,000. They're all the enterprise brands that, that are doing that, whether it's thumbs up, thumbs down, or text message. I mean, the world, the really world really runs you know, feedback on, on our systems. Yeah. Or within academia. How many of you use this in college? Whatever, yeah. So, it's, Look, it's great. Uh, I mean, another thing that you've done is, is you, you use Utah as this, you've talked about it a little bit, but you've used it as, as like an advantage. You know, you, you can sit back and say, well, you know, you can't get talent there, you know, tech talent, you know, you're you're not near funding, you know, what the, the big you know, the big companies aren't gonna take you seriously because you know you don't you're not on one of the coasts in the United States or some big international city. Um, but you sort of like turn that story on its head and used it as, hey, here's what we have that we have advantages for. I wonder if you got people I mean, there's a there's a group of fifty people here from Pakistan. Uh, just to give one example, there's people from all over the world here. What you would tell people as a trying to craft their own stories? How can I, you know, what do I look at? How do I take what things pers people perceive as a disadvantage and turn them into advantages for, for our story or company? Yeah, I think, I think Utah is a, a, a phenomenal place. I was born in Oregon, and my father was an academic, and we moved from the University of Oregon, where, where he taught, to BYU, where I went to school, where Derek and I met, like Halo and our dorm rooms. Um, but if I do, do you want to add how good I was, or <laughs> <laughs> I won't give you a screen name either. <laughs> but it's stuck with them. The, the the one thing. <laughs> Sorry. But do you also want to add that I asked you while we played Halo one night what you this about the startup you're working on? Do you want to? I think that you also brought that in. That's your story. We're sitting there playing video, playing video, video games, games, and I heard Ryan's working on a startup, which I was interested in. I said, wow, cool, Ryan, like, what's this new startup you're working on? And he's like, oh, it's a survey product for colleges. And I was like, cool, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. I'd asked him a question for like seven years. I'm going to be an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be an accountant. You're going to be working on the bag. No, no, Derek's not. <laughs> Right, well, yeah, but, but yeah, that's that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> you wouldn't have, we wouldn't have that Eric, I love you. Okay. <laughs> but look, I think I think Utah's a special place. I mean I don't think anyone has the exclusive on smart people, would you say? How many people are here are from the Bay Area? Alright, more people have used Qualtrics than that. Think about that, right? So all of you are here, but you come from somewhere. And if you actually think about that, um, we want to invest and we want to make a difference. We want to make a legacy. The same way I look back now and I'm like, whoa, we not only did this, but we did it in Utah and I did it with my family. Right? Like if you could do it, what do you want to do with your dad and your brother if you could make it work? And I think it was part of the success of Qualtrics because at the end of the day, I was able to iterate to levels with my brother that most co-founders could never iterate to. We were able to go, our pain threshold is so high with each other. Right? So normally when I'm going through a problem with someone, and I see your brother Brant right there, you two would be phenomenal co-founders because you could go so deep with each other and you, you gotta love him in the morning, right? Jared had to love me 
when he woke up in the morning so we could hash it out. And all the other employees were like, oh my gosh, are we going to have a job tomorrow? <laughs> and we're like right back at it the next day. But all the innovation happened in the iteration 13 or 14 or 15. Where most people, the pain threshold, they just give up because it's so awkward after the third iteration. Well, okay, I'll just continue. And it's like, no. Like, we're having a standoff. I mean, we had a standoff for four years about raising venture capital. And guess what happened? Our valuation went up $100 million a year. Right? So, when you don't know what to do, it's just hold. And that was the thing. And so if you look at Utah, we've been able to do that same thing in Utah. And we had more more ideals that we would have been the third major IPO in enterprise software with Pluralsight and Domo last year um, than New York City. But how is that possible? You know, if you look at, I mean, Pluralsight's a $4 billion company. Look at us. We have Vivint next door. So it's $3 billion companies, Ancestry.com, Vivint, and ourselves on one street in Provo, Utah. I mean, that's, that's the promise of the internet that we're creating. And we just had a conference called Silicon Slopes. We had 23,000 people at Silicon Slopes the first, the second week of the Sundance Film Festival, and it's it's really it's really really cool. And you're seeing the same thing in Austin. You're seeing the same thing. That's the Dublin, the IDA out there. We did that same thing in Dublin. And so, if you've got smart people, the only thing you're missing is success because success breeds success. And what we've missed in Utah is we've missed. The success since Word Perfect, since Omniture, yeah. since Nobel, and now you're seeing this ecosystem that I saw when I went to Dublin for the first time because I saw that there was LinkedIn, there was Twitter, there was Microsoft, there was Google. I'm like, wait, if they can all be successful here, you know, I'm at least it's half as smart as them. Like, we should be able to do something, right? And then it worked out. And so I think these ecosystems do it, but there's also one other factor: is you've got to have a talent hub which you have in the university systems. So if I were to say, hey, where are the next ones? It's going to be Raleigh. You know, it's no surprise that Austin's what it is. So if you look at the factories, and, and by the way, pulled Stanford out 30 years ago out of the Bay Area, and I don't think Silicon Valley becomes what it is. And so that's what makes it. And there's a lot of places that aren't harnessing that educational system the way that people have it. We've done a great job. Um, in Utah, given where we've all come out of um, I, I'd like to close by just talking to you a little bit about getting acquired, because sometimes we hear people like, look, let's build a great product, get some customers, raise your venture capital, and then shouldn't Google or Adobe or SAP just just automatically buy me? Um, talk, talk to us a little bit about this. like. How, how do I get my company? Is that just going to happen? Like, or, or what yeah, I mean, there's 300 happen? unicorns right now. I think they're all just going to be bought, right? I mean, no, it doesn't happen that way. I mean, you get to a size where people just can't buy you. Um, I have a lot of friends who are 15 to $20 billion. And who's going to buy them? they got to pay a premium on top of that, right? Um, you know, Bill McDermott just came out on the earnings call and said, I'm not buying anyone until the Paul Tricks debt is fully paid back. Adobe just bought Marketo. They're not buying anything. Right? And so I think the answer is everyone should just plan on building a company that you're going to keep forever and you're going to go public with. I mean, there's just no other option. There's no upside in thinking you're going to get acquired for you or the team. There's no upside. So build something that you're going to hold on to forever, that you're going to sleep in that bed every single night, that you're going to keep Figure out how to monetize it, that your only exit and way to get money out is you gotta do it the hard way where you actually make it. And good things will happen to you. And that's exactly what our strategy was. I literally in my head thought that the only way that we're gonna be able to monetize Qualtrics is to go public for our employee base. The only time we're never gonna get acquired. And we kept our head down, and sure enough, a knock came at the door that was like, hey, we love what you're working on. We see the momentum in the marketplace. We see how this is accretive. Oh, wow, you haven't cut any corners. So we're not buying something that none of us anticipated. And I'm super excited about it. I mean, every CEO in the country just got a box today for the Fortune 500 that is like, 
this box that you open up, I, I just shared it on Twitter, but it's a it's a it's an X and O SAP Qualtrics thing. It's like it's actually I saw one that was kind of like the Taylor Swift's uh, tour that she did. And I was like, well, that's cool. We should do something like that. And and we did, right? And so they all got this box introducing Qualtrics and SAP to every CEO. We're trying. How cool is that? That's like what we all want to do. And maybe they'll know who we are. Fine. <laughs> uh, the other thing you just said was you need to plan to run this company forever. And you know, it took your overnight success, which which just happened to take 17 years. Um, you know, and as a founder, we see these companies, we read about it every day. A company, you know, gets started, gets bought after nine months, gets bought after two years, you know, and you know, as, as a founder, you know, how long really should I I mean forever seems like a really long time, especially when I'm really tired and working in my basement or my garage and you know, debt's piling up or whatever. Um, how long really should I plan to be running this company? Like, what's realistic for me to actually do? Yeah, like, whatever you think would be a long time, just double it. I think that's a good, that's a good strategy. And if that makes you sick to your stomach, I'm like, oh. Well, one of the benefits of being a founder is you get to determine and write your own playbook. Think about that. As a founder and entrepreneur, you get to decide what the story looks like. And if you think about running your business or the grind, that's why I love it's called startup grind, because it is a grind, it's freaking work. Work isn't fun. That's why it's called work, right? And if you want to go have fun, don't go to work, <laughs> right? There's a million things I'd rather do than work. Work's what we do and it's going to be a grind, and the longer you go, it's gonna be more of a grind. And I think Seth Godin says that you just gotta learn to dance with it, right? And that's the beauty of this story. And if you don't like the story that's being written, change it. I'll never forget when I was with my father here in the basement, and I was complaining because my competitors were in $40 million, they bought up the entire market around me, and I was like in his office and I was screaming at him. I was like, change the website, we've gotta go, we've gotta do this, we've gotta do this. And he's this academic who's like working on everything and the scientist, and he just finally got pissed and I've never seen him get mad at this. And he turned around and he's like, who is stopping you? And I was like, whoa. <laughs> Actually, he's right. I'm, I'm stopping myself. I'm blocking myself. My frustration is that I don't know how to go do it. And at that point, I realize there's nothing that is blocking me. And if you feel blocked, it's because you need to learn more and you're blocking yourself as an entrepreneur because there's nothing, absolutely nothing stopping you. So if you're not having fun or it's too much of a grind or it gives you a heartburn to think about going for a long time, Fix it. Right? So that's that's my thought. And that's the that's the strategy we have. This isn't fun. We'll go into a new market. Do something different. You know, and this is why it's important that you don't set the stage around you where whether it's through taking bad investment early on or stuff like that, that then make it so you can't fix the fun and you're just in this little box where you can't move. So uh, anyways, that was a, that was kind of like an emotional. Ryan Smith, CEO of Matterport.